A very hearty welcome to everybody from around the globe. We're very thrilled to have people from Africa, from, uh, there's Beatrice just coming in from Zimbabwe. Fantastic. From Africa, from Europe, from the United States, from Canada. And it's really exciting to see you all here today. Um, our ser series is called 5050, which means that we really appreciate and seek out the opinions of everybody who joins us. And at our last session in April, it was so cramped packed because we'd had many events and we spoke about all these events which were interconnected from Reactus, which is an aging research conference in Strasbourg that had a look at what in fact COVID had done to human rights of the older people. And then we were in URAG where they did a brain conference. And then we were at the United Nations and um, we had we try to pack all these things in on the one side. So today we've decided to give ourselves a little bit of space to discuss and to digest a bit what has happened and to find out more specifically what can actually come out of what happened last month. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Osnat, who's just uh, prepared for us a little refresher so we know what we're talking about. Osnat, can you go ahead? Yes, absolutely. So, okay. Can everybody see? The there you go. Very yes. good. Great. Now, uh, just just a little request: if you're not speaking, if you can mute yourself, because everything you hear, we hear, and uh, that could be disruptive. So. As Moira just said, we went on a little tour there between February and April, between Reactis in Strasbourg and York in Prague and Fufa in Paris. And Design for Seniors in Paris, that was part of the global rally of Garop, which happened around the same time. And all that, all these are interconnected and they led to the UN 13th open-ended working group on aging in New York City, where we had uh, a delegation from Paciton Network and so many other uh, organizations who care about the rights of all the people. So, yes, here we go. This, that's a little uh, promotional thing for the open-ended session. It is number 13. It was number 13. It means that they've been meeting now for 13 years, trying to uh, uh, aim at that um, uh, a goal of a strengthening the protection of human rights of all the persons. Just to remind you that uh, this is the venue. The venue was the United Nations, one of those big assembly rooms where uh, you had a panel of experts in the uh, front of the room, the countries, the member states in the uh, right in front of them, and here at the back of the room. Uh, where all the, the civil societies, the NGOs, and human rights the watch organizations, and individual, um, the older adults. The, every year, the, the uh, open-ended uh, working group focuses on two specific uh, topics. This year, it was about social inclusion of older persons, and the second one was the right to health and access to health services for all the persons. We also mentioned that uh, what fuels the process is enhanced opportunities, access to resources, impactful voice and respect. And that is true for any gap that you see uh, about the rights of all the people for uh, various uh, human rights. This year was a breakthrough I have not participated in any of the previous ones, but uh, I was uh, very um, fortunate and thankful to be in this year of breakthrough. There was a global agreement to move forward with identifying the gaps in human rights protections between the Convention for Human Rights for any people to the ones that for all the people, and to define the next steps toward drafting a Convention for Human Rights for all the people. So that's a big step because before, until now, there were all kinds of um, hesitation and avoidance and things like that. And finally, we have something in writing that everybody seems to rally around. 
Um, this was something that uh, we challenged you uh, last in, in, in our April 5050. Do you know your human rights as an older person? And the thing is that older people need specific uh, uh, needs, they have specific needs that go beyond regular human rights. And I showed you two examples. This was an example from India where a, a widow is uh, sleeping in the street because once her husband died, her fam the family of the husband did not want her in the home anymore. And this is the right to live in safety without violence, neglect, abuse, exploitation, and not treated with a cruel and humane manner. Those of you who live in, in the Western countries know that uh, these things are usually more um, uh, concealed. But in uh, other countries, uh, sometimes they're right there in front of you. But why limit ourselves to India? We showed another thing. This was uh, Hurricane Harvey in 2017. And this picture was taken in Texas in uh, a nursing home, ironically called La Vita Bella. Uh, and these are dementia patients that for eight hours were sitting there uh, in water up to their waist until the local authorities managed to uh, notice it because it went viral on, on the social media and sent help to evacuate them. And it's a right to include all the person needs in relief measures, disasters, for disasters for conflict areas and other emergencies. Uh, last month we have a, we had a, um, uh, our representative from, from Ukraine, and she told us all these different things that are happening to older adults in conflict areas, and it's not much different as far as considerations of what to do for them. We also ran a poll, and in this poll, we, uh, I just showed the seven areas of uh, gaps, that uh, areas that need attention when you think about uh, human rights for all the people. And uh, you can see that uh, um, the, the question was, what do you see in your own community? And uh, we, we got uh, some of the stuff was not that visible in your community and maybe happening there. So we're going to um, look at this a little bit more today. And uh, in the material that I sent uh, uh, afterwards, uh, we had, a, I don't know, 12 more, all kinds of uh, gaps. You can see that the uh, uh, some of these things are very pertinent for people in the Western world, long-term palliative care and, and uh, uh, end-of-life uh, care, uh, education, training, uh, sometimes down to just validation that an older person has something valuable to contribute to society. So I'm going to stop sharing here. And what we'd like to do today is um, dive deeper into the challenge of aging with rights. Just so you uh, have in mind here, we have uh, several experts and people who were in, the, uh, in New York uh, in that week of uh, open-ended uh, working group. We have Bruce Frankel. Bruce, maybe you can just uh, wave your arm wildly. We have uh, Margaret Young, who's the chairperson of uh, Garrop. Uh, we have uh, Moira, of course, who is the uh, co-founder of Pasito Network. And then we have also other people, and, and, the, and the Adrian Berg, of course, there she is, Adrian, wave. And the people who weren't there, but are here with us every single day. Uh, we're, we're going to hear from all of you as we continue this discussion. And, and the thing that I'd like to bring here is let's not wait until the UN comes up with a convention. The only reason they're discussing it is because of you, because individuals and organizations that you belong to uh, are bringing it up to the layers of formal state institutions. Otherwise, the UN will not even have looked at it. Something we learned in New York City in that during that week was that many governments uh, and local and national institutions have approved initiatives and policies on paper, but they have not allocated their, the resources to implement them. How could we help? How could we help them to 
convert those papers into action and make it a priority. The second thing that we learned there was there is a clear exclusion of all the people. All the people are the experts on their own condition and situation and needs. And there was a clear exclusion of them from forums that decide how to help them, how to help us. So here's another question. How will we become part of the decision-making process? Um, the same way that we are decision makers for our own lives. This quickly became uh, our rallying call to action. And there are two versions to it. One is when you say it out of your heart, there's nothing about us without us. And the other version is nothing about all the people without all the people. And we're going to repeat this several times today and see what, what does it actually mean to us. So all of us present here, and those who are going to be watching this video uh, after the video recording, we're here because we are these people. We care about this and all the, all the we care about us and we care about the, the uh, future of future older people. We are part of communities and networks that are already making a difference every single day. So yeah, nothing about us without us. And uh, so in a moment, we're going to get into our conversation. But first, I'd like to uh, present to you a poll. So we'll see who we have here. Um, so the question is, uh, where are you active in advocating for the rights of all the people? And there are two options. I'm a member of an advocacy organization network. I lead advocacy efforts as an individual. And there's a third option that says other. So go ahead and, and uh, let's see who, who are we here. Can you see it? So we have um, many people who are members of advocacy organizations or networks. We have, uh, I can see Helen where your question comes from. You might be both, but uh, it's, it's, it was, the questions are deliberately like this. So you can make a decision because if you are a member of an advocacy organization, you may be also leading advocacy as an individual, and there is somebody who is others. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing here. Yeah. So given all that, uh, we did not want to uh, create here a like a panel of, of uh, presentations of everybody, because we did it last time. We did it in April. We wanted to uh, turn this into a conversation of everything that you heard in the past 10 minutes that I kind of, uh, I guess like, like a fire hose, just, just blurted it all out. Uh, let, let's uh, see a, if you have any questions to the people who were there. If you have any thoughts about, think about nothing without us, nothing about us without us, or nothing about all the people without all the people. Let, let's, let's try to start here. What kind of examples you could point out that are missing the perspective of old people in your environment? In community, city, state. Let's start there and see where it takes us. So the way you raise your hand is you go to the reaction button at the bottom and there is something that's called raise hand and then you can raise hand or you can do what Jacqueline did, uh, just raising your hand and go ahead Jacqueline. Yeah, say um, I, I would say even though it's demanded most of the time for any type of project, research project, international project, um, you should include older persons right from the beginning. And in many cases, they're included at the end to just go over what 
people I've worked on. And I think we should really, really push that forward that anything that is being developed for older persons should include the older persons from the start. And uh, it's in Europe in the Horizon 2020 for research. It said they have to be included in the project proposals. Um, but the question is, is that really done? Or do you just then at the end say, what do you think of this? Okay, that's that's what I wanted to say. Mm. Michelle? <clears throat> yeah, my thought was in the schools. Um, there's such a lot being done now to, at least here in the USA, <clears throat> to rewrite history so that we don't know about what happened in the past. And uh, I think that the um, older person should be there presenting some of the stuff, even though it would be from their perspective, um, in, the, in the classroom. Um, so, so that we're, you know, they, they un we've been there firsthand or at least something like that and can present that perspective as opposed to just being people that were, 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 were just old and we, we're just not in the present moment. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that was it. Adrian? I just, uh, yes, I just unmuted. Um, I want to uh, talk about nothing about us without us a little bit differently. So one of the things that I'm doing privately uh, is the ageless traveler. And I'm hoping to work with the UN as I'm, I am in aging on mature travel. But when we say nothing about us without us, we usually mean that we should have some input in what's going on in policy, in every uh, aspect that affects us in technology. But however, I've just discovered uh, a flaw in that thinking which is that most of the people who are working that are going to make a difference and make that policy are younger. So I'm adding another level to it, that nothing without us, nothing about us without us should be us training them, not just us putting the input in directly, because we may not be on the scene, but if we can create an understanding in younger people who are active working younger people, that are making the policies across the commercial board, in politics, everywhere, what it means to be us, then they can say, and they can infuse their understanding of us into their policy making. So I think that there's another level here. It's not just us being heard directly, but us being heard by other decision makers that are younger. So they have an understanding of what they're doing. In the technology industry, that's beginning. They used to have, if they were forward thinking, older people explaining what they needed for the technology to be friendly. Now the older people are explaining to the coders, to the developers who are much younger, maybe even in the early 20s and 30s, what it means. And so they already know how to apply nothing about us without us, without us which I think is something we need to do and develop in, in a policy as well as in the commercial area. So that's, that's my little take on that. So we're training young hospitality people to understand the mature guest because the mature guest is not there uh, as a, you know, in the business, they are the, the guests. So when the business understands it, it's much better for us. And I think we can do that in policy as well. So if we can add that, uh, identified pol younger policymakers that are interested in understanding what nothing about us without us means, they can be emissaries mm -hmm. for aging, as well as the fact that they'll be older too eventually. So, and they can yeah. do that to their next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, sometimes there's, the, there's always a risk that um, without the lived experience, People who, are, who want to help, help excessively and maybe indirect their, misdirect their, their efforts and to the point where you, you might even lose your autonomy because of this. Uh, so I think there's probably a balance there. And, and I, I'd like to actually hear from Margaret, who is the most vocal 
person or nothing without us, not nothing about us without us. Uh, what's your take? Hmm. I think um, for me personally, um, interesting. I, you know, it's a, uh, it's in the context of many things, right? When we think of human rights and advocacy, and I know that we our conversation has kind of gone a little bit more broadly about policy or projects, which is all important. But if I, because I, I, I speak a lot on human rights, if I can kind of get back to the human rights piece. Uh, when I hear the term, nothing about us without us, I think sometimes uh, it, uh, it's in the context of who we're speaking with. Right, so if in that moment we need to champion with some key stakeholders who is adamant on not hearing, uh, powerful slogans like "age of rights" or "nothing without older people," nothing about older people without older people, come across strong, like strongly in that moment to kind of succinctly get that message across. But mm -hmm. in reality, it, it's a bit like what Adrian is saying, that that we need that uh, intergenerational and broader community piece to make the human rights um, come to life uh, in, in older age. Um, I was uh, watching uh, a segment of uh, one, because of the global rally, we have many different campaigns. And there was one that's in uh, Latin America. Now, not that I understand Spanish, but but I, I grasp enough that, that they had young people saying, age of rights, and they keep repeating it in Spanish, right? All these young people, I age of rights, I age of rights, and I can't go, okay. And then they got older people saying, I age of rights. So this is their way of saying that to age of rights into, it's a life course and into old age is important. So, the, so to me, that they got the community, that group anyways, understanding the importance of age of rights and older age, because younger people are doing it. In Mauritius, they actually did a video in the same theme and they had younger people, um, uh, pretending to be older people and living the lives of older people. And they had a short segment where they're kind of doing things and then, you know, the, uh, and they're pretending to have aches and pain because of aging. And then they talk a little bit about human rights. So I think, I think it's a much broader, like when we look at uh, the whole human rights movement for older people, right? Because at the UN too, we'd be experienced as not just uh, certain NGO advocates, it's actually NHRIs. It's even people like doctors who serve, like we had a, we had a palliative care doctor who was in one of the sessions and she asked very good questions about what she can do. So it's much, very much, uh, I think, coming together of all these uh, forces and individuals and different sectors, understanding the importance of human rights because of this whole longevity thing that we have, right? We're all going to get there. Like it's yeah. going to be even longer, more challenging. So, so to me, that's a frame of sometimes when you use the slogan, like in what context do we use it? And then and then when to apply it so that it's effective for the situation. And I quite like how uh, what um, Adrian said about helping the younger generation understand, because really it is it is their lives to moving forward, right? Uh, and it's getting that into general. And then and it, even in the general population piece is not even the youth millennials. I was speaking with someone else who who's a baby boomer, and he's he was saying how in the baby boomer segment there's that opportunity to change, to impact change because they can see that gap. So it's many generations that, that now that, you know, we, we think about this more deeply about the work ahead of us. Yes, I think the, the, uh, the notion that we need to think along life course as opposed to uh, as about specific generations or specific age groups was a, a very strong point during the uh, last three months in all those events. Uh, anybody else who wants to comment on what we've just heard and your own in insight? Moira, yeah. And, and then Jen. Moira, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a blatant example of where older people are left out is a recent program of the uh, European Union on digital literacy. It's a fantastic program, and there's there literally you know millions and millions of um, euros being pumped into it. But I read it, and it's long; it's about twenty pages. And I read through it um, scrupulously, and there was not one single mention of older people. It's all about young people, 
It's all, you, you know, which is great. They have to be, everybody has to be, but there was not a single mention about older people. So once you, once you get to 60, 65, you've forgotten in terms of anything that has to do with learning. You don't need to learn anymore. Whereas this is, a, as we all know, a vital, a vital area for all older people. Thanks. Jen? Uh, I <clears throat> right now in the U.S., uh, the words, the, the initials DEI are, you see everywhere, uh, all policies, any group that I'm part of, we want to be sure that we pay attention to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. <clears throat> There's a, fortunately, <clears throat> a, a, a great emphasis on uh, making sure that people are, are included. And I think we need to show that older adults are part of this picture. We tend to think about race, religion, ethnic background, indigenous peoples, but we also need to be sure that we think about people who are uh, older adults who are otherwise uh, you know, left out. We need to be see that all of us are included. Uh, everyone needs to be uh, heard in the process of dealing with issues that clearly affect them. Uh, and I do want to point to a really great positive step that's been taken right here in the U.S. Uh, by our Secretary General, who's like the Secretary of Health for the, for the country, uh, who just uh, has uh, uh, issued an advisory on the topic of loneliness and social connection and a wonderful report that goes with that. Uh, he shows that these, these ways of leaving people out uh, have, uh, and, uh, have been exacerbated by the pandemic on the one hand, the COVID, uh, by the uh, uh, social media, people being on the, interacting with their phone, but not necessarily the people around them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, that this, this kind of loneliness, which we know is perhaps even greatest for people who are adolescents, uh, also it, it very clearly, he, and he speaks specifically to older adults, particularly those who are isolated uh, because of uh, 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 disabilities, uh, and I, I think that the uh, kinds of uh, uh, policies, changes that he recommends in that report, and I will send you a copy of the summary of the report, uh, um, uh, Osnet, to make available to the group. I do think that, that he has offered so much. I, by the way, was fascinated to see that he actually has his own blog uh, his name is Murthy, M-U-R-T-H-Y. His background is from India. Uh, and his family uh, immigrated from India. And he has a blog and is uh, very much a part of Krista Tippett's program called On Being. I would imagine that many of you have heard from her, of her either uh, on radio uh, uh, or uh, on her writings. But he, in other words, he is very, very clearly talks about all of us being part of this interdependent web of all living beings. And uh, that, that also, I think, emphasizes the importance of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. <clears throat> this is fascinating and, and I'm looking forward to share the, the report with everybody else. So uh, Helen, you are next, and then um, uh, Valerie after Helen. I just wanted to add to, to what um, Jan was referencing and uh, the real issue with DEI or EDI or whatever, and now we have B added to it, which is belonging, is the fact that age is not included as a diversity um, uh, criteria. If you added age diversity, then you could have you'd have multiple uh, differences because you can add age just like you can with ability or disability 
to every other ism that is out there or identity that's out there. So um, I've been advocating for age diversity for years, um, and there's less than 8% globally of organizations that include age in the diversity initiatives. But on, I also wanted to say that I'm part of a, a an advisory with HR and new research has come out. And I'd say over 80% of the people who are HR and um, HR leaders, and, and this is all the United States, um, say that their EDI is, is just not working. It's um, window dressing. People are not taking it to heart. So all of the initiatives and all of the emphasis is really just another initiative in the right direction. But if it's not modeled by leadership, then it's, it's unfortunately not happening. So it was very discouraging to hear that. Hmm. Besides the fact that age isn't included. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, discouraging. What's what's coming from the UK, Valerie? Um, actually, it's not from the UK, but it's the report that Jan was just talking about. I already had the link to it. So it, it's already up and on the chat. Good. Good. Very Thank good. you. Thank You're you very welcome. much. And by the way, I'm 81 and three quarters and my birthday is on the 4th of July. So um, uh, and, and if anyone wants to get hold of me, Jan, uh, Moira and I have known each other for donkey's years. And Learn with Grandma is now in 51 countries around the world. And the whole concept of Learn with Grandma is about encouraging intergenerational learning and active aging. Great. And, and just if you look in the chat, you see that uh, Valerie has uh, uh, a longer description there. And uh, I don't know if you added your email address there so people can yes, contact the, you. A young lady from Ireland asked me for it, so it is there. <coughs> but Moira has it and anyway. Okay. So the young lady from Ireland. She has. I was hacked and lost her, so I need yours again, Moira. Okay. The young lady from Ireland, Mary Carroll. Hi, everybody. I, I kind of feel a little bit like I'm going to drop in some. Uh, by the time I finish, you'll go home feeling very happy um, because on this side of the world, we're still stuck in mobility, home care, uh, keeping people inside or outside of a care home. And um, the broader concept of, um, you know, sort of older people being able to live a fulfilling and enjoyable and exciting life is almost alien to us over here. Um, and uh, we have a huge homeless crisis, which is really beginning to to hit those who are kind of, say, the over 55s, because a lot of them would have been in rental situations for maybe the last 10 or 12 years due to life circumstances and um and now they're not in a position to either get a loan to have the financial stability to actually take on um a long-term rental and um a lot of people particularly those who might have some mobility challenges are being forced to go into living conditions that are not really adequate for any kind of a fulfilling life um so i'm really heartened to hear that kind of you know you're about sort of you know seven or eight steps ahead of us and um, because that gives me great heart so it may not be perfect on your own doorstep but please be assured and um, it gives me lots of um i use the word ammunition lightly but it gives me lots of ammunition to go to our local politicians and leaders to say this is happening in the world older people are being respected and they are being offered opportunities to develop, to live a fulfilling life. And uh, there's no reason why we can't follow. So um, please don't be disheartened. It's certainly very, very um, innovative for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Carol. This is a, you know, the, the work is never done. It's always work in progress. So we will never get there, but the journey can be, uh, fulfilling. And uh, I'm going to call on Jeff and then add Adrian. So Jeff, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I want to go back to something that I think was said the last time, which is about how uh, I think I think Margaret brought it up, which was about how many elders know their rights 
um, and equate that to human rights. But um, here in the U.S., the, May is Older Americans Month, and yeah. it's now the 60th anniversary of that uh, proclamation. And one of the things that it offers, there's all sorts of ideas about what one can do to honor elders during Old Americans Month. But there's also a, a template of a proclamation. I've used it before to get the mayor of our community to recognize and declare May as Old Americans Month in my community. Um, I'm wondering if if we have can have a, either a similar proclamation that's universal, um, or even the um, oh I, the online I forgot what it's called, but it's the online uh, petitions that anyone can can create that would uh, anyone can create and anyone can sign that would perhaps get the ball rolling in terms of creating more awareness of aging with rights and being anyone could sign it, anyone could sign it, whether they're young or old. Um, and I think that might be a way that we can start to stir the pot, if you will. So I throw that out as an idea. Okay. Adrian, you next. I'm unmuted. Um, I just want to go back to your original question, nothing about us without us. And I'm having trouble with the word us. You know, one of the things we do with the NGO Committee on Aging in New York is we have a newsletter. And we did a piece on the human rights of older women. And it was felt to me to define older women. Brother, was that something? Because I had never seen the gap in any of the other issues, like maybe indigenous people, but the gap between uh, older women who are in the street, like you just showed in India, and older women who are in my Palm Springs community playing pickleball at the same ages. I don't think there's a bigger gap of inequality and haves and have nots in almost any other sector that we talk about. And so it's very difficult to say nothing about us without us, without us defining what we mean. And I think as uh, Margaret said, it depends on who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be very aware that we've got um, people who are, are being robbed of all their lands in Africa just because they're a certain age and Nancy Pelosi, and they're both 82 years old. So age is just not the thing here that we're really talking about. We have to make it clear to policymakers, um, who they need to adjust their thinking about. Otherwise, it's going to be either a perpetuation that older adults are just needy and waste of space, and all you have to do is pay money to keep them around, versus what are you talking about? We have 54% of all the money in the US in terms of, of the, our net worth. So I think that's an issue. I think we have a responsibility to define what we mean with nothing about us, without us, who we're talking about. And the only way to do it realistically is framing specific situations, as I hope the open-ended group is doing now, with specific gaps and what policymakers and decision makers need to do about it for the different us's that we all are. Yeah. Here, here. Uh, Bruce, you next, and then Mary Jo. Thank you. So, um, first of all, I second what Adrian said. I thought uh, that was really great, Adrian. I, uh, and it, it seems like the most important part in, in many ways is when you look at the statistics, when you look at the stories, when you listen to people, um, you hear that disparity between uh, women in other parts of the world and, and men um, certainly have age against them in places, but nothing like women. And so I, I you know, almost don't want to even go on with what I've said, but I will say I... I I'm feeling a little bit hopeful about one thing, and I just I, I I sometimes get fearful 
that we paint ourselves into a victim place. And I think that we have to assert our power rather than victimhood. And um, I'm somewhat buoyed by some recent statistics that I've been looking about at, um, about the re-engagement of older adults in the workplace after the pandemic, uh, which um, signal a few things as um, there are more in the United States today uh, since 2022, there are more 65 and older persons employed than there are teenagers. Um, that's never been true before. Um, and it, it during the pandemic, I think something like about 1.8 million or I'm sorry, more than that, 3.2 million um, Americans 65 and older left the workforce in the first year of the pandemic. But since 2022, there's been a great rehiring and a great return to the workforce. And part of what's happening is that as um, businesses cannot find enough people to employ, they're turning to older adults and they're adapting and they're accommodating. And if you, in today in the New York Times, for instance, there's a piece on the aging of China. Um, I think, I can't remember the statistic, but something on the order of 40% of China will be 65 and older. So uh, very soon. So the, the point is, is that Nations are going to have to, um, and economies are going to adapt. They're going to have to adapt or businesses aren't going to function anymore. And that's already beginning to happen. And the question I have is really, how can uh, we assert the power that is implied by both uh, the human resource of older adults and as Adrian pointed out, the uh, great wealth that exists with older adults. I don't think that um, older adults have to live in a space of victimhood. And, and those of us who can have every obligation to speak on the behalf of those who can't. Let these words echo. Thank you, Bruce. I just wanted to throw in some distinction because the wealth that is within the hands of baby boomers, older adults, is not equally distributed either. And we know that when you start adding um, the other variables into this, the, like economic status uh, and, and um, education and race and, and gender and things like this and other uh, indicators, then things be begin to look very, very differently and not everybody has the wealth. Um, still, uh, we need to raise, to make our voice heard. Uh, I put, you know, I went to chat GPT yesterday and I said, hey, write me some letters to our elected officials. And then I edited it, it a little bit and you can edit it more. But it's always easier to edit somebody else's work. So if you find that this is going to be helpful for you to send something to your local elected officials or policymakers, go right ahead. There's a link in the chat. And uh, I want to ask Mary Jo to say her words next. Thank you. And thank you for that very that lovely lead in. I live in Minnesota. Minnesota has, uh, it gets a lot of strokes in the United States for having a very strong program, for being ahead of the curve with older adults, we do a great job with service. We do a great job with patting hands and funding care facilities. We don't do as good a job planning. And I've been a member of the Minnesota Board on Aging for the last three years. I am no longer a member. So I am not speaking on behalf of the MBA this morning, but I wanted to share with you all, because what you just said, Osnet, about getting hold of your legislature, Lator, um, the MBA had a task force and we put together an initiative, a legislative task force on aging 
that was initially supported by the entire Minnesota Board on Aging. It was introduced last fall. We didn't get very far because we were late and disorganized. We introduced it again this spring in the current legislative session. It has both House and Senate sponsorship. It is in the omnibus bill. It does look like it will be funded and approved. And what it does, and this was the complaint that many of us on the MBA had, again, I'm speaking for myself, not the MBA. Me on the MBA had this concern. We don't plan. All we do is try to plug holes. And the holes that we've been plugging have been services. We haven't been looking out and saying, how do we make sure older adults are trained? How do we make sure older adults have housing moving forward? And Minnesota this year will have a million people over the age of 65. Our population has done that tip that we've all been moving toward for the last 10 years. So it's very exciting that we have legislators who understand the value of this kind of thinking. And just to bring it back to the nothing for us without us, the name of the task force is a legislative task force on aging. And within the bill, it talks about who needs to be on this task force. And it, it is a good group of representative people I can, if you'd like, direct you to the actual content of the bill, but I'm just saying that it's interesting. This feels like a small thing. It's been really hard. It's not done. It could, it could get tanked, but it looks like it's not going to get tanked. And then the next thing is, once the work of the task force is done, will it be able to have an, any impact at all? So just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. I, 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 I want to come back to something I said in the beginning is that one of the things that we learned in the, uh, when we were there in New York with the UN is that a lot of countries, municipalities, lo localities, states, whatever, have, a, have approved plans that even set budget for, uh, but have not been implemented because of a shortness in resources or um, priorities change, all kinds of stuff like this, even if something is approved. And uh, I actually followed on one of them a few weeks ago. Uh, in California, there's a huge initiative about that was approved in 2019 uh, to, in, in general, and in not so many words, to elevate the condition of older adults, whether it's education on digital, closing digital divide and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, I looked at their uh, scorecard and it looks like about 10% of the work, and there are like over a hundred initiatives there, 10% of the work has started, has started on 10% of the initiatives and none of them is over 24%. The rest of them are a lot lower. So maybe they started paperwork or something like this. So the likelihood that something that is approved on a state level will reach the people who need it within a reasonable time, let's say within their lifetime, uh, is, uh, is, is not very assured. So we shouldn't celebrate just the fact that our um, policymakers created a policy it needs to go into uh, execution application and actually happen and, and make an, an impact on the real population. So that was my little soapbox and I'm going to pass it on to Margaret. So um, I think a, a couple of, of things. Um, so first, just to build off uh, what uh, Osnat said, um, in terms of policy, uh, globally, there is the Madrid International Plan on Aging, which is as robust of a plan on policy relative to uh, social uh, public health that can exist for older people. Um, with that, it's gone through iteration and, 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 and all the countries are committed to do that, right? They sign off and say, yes, we will go back and implement it within our country uh, and break down the plan some more, tailor it to what's needed specifically. So that plan has always been stop and go, stop and go, right? in terms of like how much is implemented. When, when countries come back to report it at, at UN, it's very slow. 
such that earlier this year in January, when there's a global review, right, once again with all the countries, it was stated as one of the recommendations that there needs to be an international instrument on human rights of older people. It's stated like at the UN. Um, so not only with that group, but also with uh, the Human Rights Council. And, and the reason really is that there's twofold, right? So when we think about a human rights instrument, it's a framework that covers everything, right? From health to, uh, and that could be like digital technology access that which then impacts health, impacts services, a whole bunch of things. So it's very well connected when there's a human rights framework. So to even on the topic of health, it's not just about access to long-term care or palliative care, it's about health promotion. So it looks at it from a very good uh, um, uh, well-being approach when it, when it does get translated into policy. So, so that's why the, the, uh, you know, advocates who are really deep into this keep saying, we need a new international framework that talks about human rights in, in older age. It could be some of the things that exist today. For example, Thomas was flagging for us that, you know, religion, right? So religion's a part, it's, it, we can think of it as part of like uh, cultural rights that's embedded in all our countries already through the international covenant that was signed off at the UN. But then what Thomas pointed out is that, you know, with surveys recently is showing that, you know, older people value it more in older age religion and spirituality versus younger people. And because of, of the circumstances and life experience, whatever it might be. So with that information, then when we come to work on a framework then we need to think about what that means for older person in terms of human rights, because ultimately that could impact someone's social well-being and mental health well-being in older age. So that's how human rights framework can connect things for us. And with human rights, it's no longer a need. Is no longer a need that the, the governments and service provider need to address. It's a must have. I have a right to these things, right? So, so, so that's the power of the human rights instrument. And that's why I spend my time working on this. Like I've worked on policy before and all that, which is also very important. I continue to do some of that. It's, it's kind of like um, measures that we can do in terms of like immediately providing the help that's needed, right? If someone is homeless, we need to do something about it now and not wait for a human rights instrument. But the long term, the game is, is a human rights instrument. Um, because it would also, to very much of Bruce's point, there are some of us who can speak up and some who just cannot. Like I hear stories in developing country that makes me cry all the time. So that drives me to do what I do <laughs> in terms of the human rights piece. Uh, for Jeff, you know, your, your comment about proclamation, um, at the Global Alliance for the Rights of All the People, which, which passed it on network as a member, we, we were like contemplating of creating a, um, a e-petition so that anyone in, the, in, in multiple languages, so that anyone can sign and support uh, the rights of all the people. And the goal is that once someone signs it, it would then pop up on a global map so that we can see, oh, how many people in Canada are signing? And we were talking about, do we make it like H, age group kind of not specific to the person's age, but can show, for example, like, like it's a 70 year old who's signing versus a, a 30 year old who's signing to show A, um, that there is voices who want a convention and B, to tell the member states, hey, these constituents, X many million or thousand or tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands in this country wants this versus and then shaming those countries who don't do take action because it'll be visible on a global map. What I found is that as I have, you know, you know, within our group, we kind of thought, okay, within this, within the group and some of the folks that we engage in terms of members, they think it's a good idea. But also, I also hear that, for example, in certain countries, there is specific procedures that they would like to follow, you know, outside of a simple petition in order to impact the government. So I'm at the stage where, you know, if you, you have comments or thoughts about how a such a global view or a campaign might be helpful or can be enhanced, I would love to hear it. Um, our communication person actually just uh, resigned at, at Garrett because he found a, a, a permanent kind of job in his home country, which is great for him. 
So we have we're on a bit of a pause while we kind of you know figure out our hiring process and, and we gain our communication staff. But if you have thoughts about whether such a global map with people signing petition makes sense, and and, and the thing is the, the what we envision is not a big long document. It'd be like five six key bullet points about why human rights matter and older age, how there is gap, government needs to support it, and we want a convention. Like simple as that. Like. That's what we're kind of maybe envisioning. So you have further thoughts on that and you can help the thinking of that or to show whether you support it or you think there's gaps in this way, you can do, we can do it better. Other ways, I would love to hear it because I would like to get moving on this based on what I heard at OEWG 13, which is still a lot of the jury in terms of member states are still out. So. I'm Margaret, sorry. maybe you can put your uh, email address there or however you go, maybe create a little questionnaire. We can. Uh... Uh, send it with the follow up for this call uh, with specific questions so people can respond back to you. I, I, I actually, uh, what you were saying was kind of interesting because the uh, Convention for Human Rights of Older Adults is our North Star, and any action from the individual to this. To the UN uh, is is should be driven by the uh, aspiration that we don't need it anymore because everything is addressed. So as long as we have gaps, we are going to act at either as individuals with our own community, family, uh, state, say a city, whatever, uh, and as country and as the world. Jeff, your comments. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'll, I'll see if I can find, there was a um, proclamation or a resolution, actually, that we proposed and wound up getting passed in, uh, I live here in Kentucky, in our state, that might be a starting point for what, Margaret, you're, you're suggesting. So let me see if I can find it. I'll put it in chat. If not, I'll send it to you um, afterwards. And it's something that, you know, anybody on this call can um, add to or or comment on or whatever. So thank you. Okay. Um, we're kind of uh, approaching, actually, we have already reached it almost, um, our formal closing time. And um, Moira, you're going to say... Um, I just wanted to say something. <laughs> I wanted to ask Adrian just to talk to us very briefly about the training that she did on on how to be an activist, because I think that's a stumbling block for a lot of people, not for us maybe, but in our organizations, people who would like to have some guidance on actually what they can do, because advocacy is a whole scope of things. Adrian, over to you briefly. Oh, thank you. I very good. So a couple of things. Anybody going to the Bangkok conference the, of IFA, uh, they've asked, Jane Barrett asked me to do an entire uh, three-hour workshop on this. Oh, wow. There's going to be a big workshop there uh, in uh, the end of June for anybody who happens to be going to that conference. So that's one thing. Second thing is, this is called Speak Out Communication. And you can get um, the, the course which is called Speak Out Communication at speakoutcommunication.com. And I wow. promised, uh, and I'll put in the, yeah, I'm going to put a free coupon code because it, it's something that gets sold to older adults uh, very inexpensively, but I'll put a, the free test is the name of the coupon and you'll just get it for free, anybody, anybody on this call. So if you want to share that with people in your organizations or yourself, you can do it. Uh, but it all started at the UN. It all started with the folks over at the uh, NGO on Aging and IFA that wanted a very quick formula to tell the story uh, in, the, in a way that will move, touch, and inspire people. And I created this from the work I was doing all these years, because I, that's my world. I think it's the world is actually in our profession, we call us talkers, been on the radio for so many years. And it worked. People said they really got something out of it that made a difference in the way they communicated advocacy. And I had a chance to use that 
at the Open-Ended Working Group on Aging, uh, a, 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 an event that Bobby Nasser did, if you know her, who's a human rights activist, a separate event to, ex to express why we in the human rights for aging world are a little miffed that when they discuss human rights at the Human Rights Commission, they don't talk about us. And I was able to use that that day and got um, a contact, was contacted by the Assistant Commissioner on Human Rights to discuss this. And what she said to me personally at the UN was, now I'm gonna be thinking about this. So I do know that this little formula works and it really takes about five minutes to put together your thinking in a way that will move, touch, and inspire people to action. It's not about simply motivation. It's about motivating to action. So if you're interested, I'll put it all in the chat, speakoutcommunications.com, free test. And for everybody here, you can just take it. But be aware that when you do, it's not made for advocates only. It's made for anybody who cannot get themselves heard if they're older whether it's healthcare or with their family or at work or as a volunteer, but it's exactly the same formula that we used. And Cynthia Stewen has a 45 minute recording just for advocates that was made at the event. So Moira, is this what you wanted me to bring out? And I can then go to the chat and put the information in, or is there something more uh, that you would like to uh, like me to say? No, that's fabulous, Adrian. Thanks very much. But I would just also like to add to that is that we've got on the call Beatrice Satoli from uh, Zimbabwe, and she runs a WhatsApp group for the University of the Third Age and has um, developed a very unique treatment that uh, fashion of get, bringing these things across. So I think it'd be very interesting for Beatrice to have a look at this training and see if she could translate it into her WhatsApp formula. Would that be possible? Well, Be Beatrice is uh, not on the call anymore, I think. Oh, there she is. She is. She is. I think are. so. Yeah. Hi, hi Beatrice. Uh, <laughs> I think she, Beatrice is on mute. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to, uh, but let, let me just take the opportunity to close the, the session formally. Um, the first thing we ask you to do is uh, I put a feedback link in the chat. So please let us know what you want to hear more about, what was useful for you, et cetera. The second thing is that uh, we are going to have uh, the recording available on the YouTube channel in a few days. And also there'll be a follow-up note with the highlights of the session today. Also within the, I don't know, five weeks, we have to get to it quickly. Uh, we invite you to come back in June. Uh, on June 12th, we're going to have uh, a slightly different topic, but not completely divorced from what we have today. Our longtime member, uh, Sylvia Zweifel from Argentina, uh, is going to explore a, di a different perspective on human rights. She has an original concept that she calls economia amable. It's called a friendly economy. And it emphasizes the importance of meeting people's needs and rights in a sustainable and inclusive way. So he's going to tell us about it and then we can also discuss it as always. Uh, so please come back on the 12th of June for that. And uh, we, first of all, want to thank you for having this conversation today. I know it was not enough. There was probably so much more to say. We'll come back to it again and again and again in various ways in the next few months. And um, we're going to close the, the call formally and leave the call open for another 10 minutes for any other things that people want to say and do. So here we go. We are formally closed and now we open. Back to you, Rainus. Oh, uh, just uh, uh, the, the short form is uh, greetings all. Uh, thank you. This topic, my Great Panthers activism, uh, the, the, I feel resonance uh, with much of the elder work these days that has lost the sense of, of, of passion and urgent intervention and doing the continual pressure to bring about 
uh, change. So it's 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 exciting just to see that that's not not been lost. Um, okay. But uh, the, uh, the, Rain, the most Rain, connection. Yeah. Rings Jack. Jack was at Jack was at the UN. Uh, yes. Thing. So it, 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 very good. Yeah, the, the, the Blue Panther is represented there. Uh, the Jack they took from in, um, and um, oh, the other connection was just international connection. Mentioning I'll be in Europe a bit this summer, and so would, would love to connect with people along the way. Infos and chat. Thank you. Excellent. Fine. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for coming and being with us. Thank you. It's like coming to a friend's party. It's so wonderful to have you all from all over the world to be there to say hello.